Hi, I'm Jean Shafroff and I'm on a mission. Anyone can be a philanthropist. My television show came from my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. Won't you join me? Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, David Kilnick. He is the co-founder, president, and CEO of LGBT Network. Let's all welcome David. And David, so great to have you with us. And uh, David, talk a little bit about the LGBT network and exactly what you do. Sure, sure. And first, you know, thank you, Jean, for um, having having us on here today to talk about the important work of the LGBT network, but for all that you do in making sure the work of our charities and our important nonprofits get out there. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about, I started this organization 28 years ago, back in 1993. And I'll tell you a little story. I was a uh, student at Stony Brook University studying for my master's in social work. And it came down to our last semester where we had to choose to either do a master's thesis or a master's project. And so, you know, I'll be honest, it was uh, when you have a choice between a huge paper and a project, I said, okay, I've done enough papers, I'm gonna do a project. And so the project was to create a curricula to go out into Long Island schools to talk about what it was like to grow up LGBT, particularly in the suburbs. So I created this curricula, got into a few schools. And when I say got into, sounds like it was a secretive mission and on the down low. Um, and it pretty much was back in 1993. And no matter where I conducted this workshop, whether it was all the way on the Western end of Long Island on the border of Nassau, Queens, or in the Hamptons or in between, there would always be a couple of kids at the end of the workshop that would shuffle their papers, they would hit them on the floor. And then they would say, uh, they would wait for everyone else to leave to come up and ask the gay speaker a question. And the question was the same, whether it was in Uniondale, near Hofstra, or, or East Hampton. And the question simply from the kids was, is there any place I can go just to meet other people like myself? And back in 1993, there wasn't. And so I said, okay, this project needs to become something. So I started a non-for-profit called Long Island Gay and Lesbian Youth, or what we call legally. And fast forward 28 years later, um, the organization has morphed into a network of nonprofits serving the LGBTQ community throughout the lifespan in Long Island and Queens. It includes the original organization legally. It also includes Long Island SAGE to serve our elders. Uh, it includes the Long Island LGBT Community Center to serve folks in between youth and elders and, um, and specific trans programming. And we also started uh, the Queens LGBT Center. So we have four community centers and um, and pretty much how we started in, in getting out into the community to create change and create safety still exists today where we're in over uh, 350 schools across uh, Long Island and Queens um, doing, uh, doing stuff. So that's just, we do so much more, but I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that. So now you explained to me earlier that you're actually in Manhattan as well and you go from Manhattan to Montauk, is that correct? Yeah, so we are, uh, we say from the Midtown Tunnel to Montauk, uh, because we literally are right past the Midtown Tunnel as you get into Queens. And so we have a, a community center that is located at Kaufman Studios in Astoria, uh, but our work does go throughout the whole borough and we have community centers in Hop Hog, which is our headquarters in Sag Harbor. Um, the only community center, LGBT center on the East End, which is so important. And we could talk about how that started um, in, in terms of a, a suicide that happened. Um, and then we are in, um, uh, coming in July, uh, you know, this July, we're opening uh, the uh, a 66 unit uh, LGBT, LGBT friendly affordable senior housing project in downtown Bayshore, which was our original home and a new community center there too. So, you know, we make sure that we're located uh, all across the island and in Queens so that we can give access to everyone. Um, but a lot of our programs are also out in the community too. Yes, now you mentioned that you're a network. So although you have your own centers, you, what do you do? You put together different groups in the LGBTQ space. Is that, is that my understanding? 
Yeah, so, you know, it, it, to serve Long Island, I mean, and Long Island, there's a reason why Long Island has that name, because it's long, right? So it's uh, 120 miles long. And so someone who's in Sag Harbor would have a very hard time getting to a community center in Bayshore. Um, and, and, you know, and you can go further west in Nassau, et cetera. So um, what we did was we came up with a different way to um, a different structure. Uh, to serve the LGBTQ community on Long Island. And so we created several nonprofits. One is legally, one is the center, as I mentioned before, the Long Island Center and the Queen Center and Sage Long Island. The LGBT network serves as the administrative arm for all of those organizations. So we didn't have to hire four or five executive directors or CEOs, four or five development departments. So that more of the support that comes to the organization goes directly to supporting the community that we're, who our mission is to serve. And so it was a, it, it's one that makes uh, financial sense um, and also programmatic sense because there's no fiefdom fights if we want to do uh, an intergenerational program, say, you know, legally doesn't need to take credit for it. Long Island Sage doesn't need to take credit for it. You know, you're not having that fighting. Um, instead, what's happening is the collaboration to make things happen and to make programs happen and to meet our mission in creating safer spaces where LGBT people live, learn, work, play, and pray. I want to step back now. The LGBTQ community of Long Island, um, there, there are problems with other people accepting this community. And although I completely disagree with anyone who discriminates against somebody in this com community, I want you to talk a little bit about the problems that exist today. Sure. So, you know, over the 28 years, um, you know, some things have changed and some things haven't. Uh, you know, I always say that fighting for equality, fighting for justice and fighting for equity is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, you know, we got to keep running that marathon, you know, just because you win, you win, you know, one piece of legislation, it doesn't mean your work is done. Our work will never be done in living in this country because until everybody could be safe to be out, to just be themselves and do whatever they want to do with their lives and achieve whatever they want to achieve. So, you know, this political climate that we're in certainly faces a challenge, you know, for the LGBTQ community, our immigrant communities, for women, for people of color. Um, and, you know, our strategy has been to try and get people to the table to talk with everyone. I think, you know, we live in a culture right now where, you know, people retreat to their own corners and there's no discussion. Um, you know, we need to have room for that dialogue to happen. And that's how we've been successful on Long Island. When we start, when I started the organization back in 1993, um, you know, and not that this means anything, but that both counties had Republican county executives and Republican controlled legislatures. It was, I didn't have an option to say, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, our kids needed that. Our kids needed a safe space. Um, you know, suicide is so high amongst LGBT youth. So I managed to, um, you know, figure out how to talk to people who may not think the same way that I think. Um, and we were able to really educate folks and come to, um, you know, come to an agreement that no kid should feel alone. No kid should feel like they have to take their own lives because of who they love. And if we're able to have those discussions, I think we'll be able to move things forward. So we're still at that point right now, but you know, I think we've done a really, really good job in bringing everyone to the table, not just those that uh, are easy, if you will. <laughs> you know, and actually, no one's really easy with the LGBT community. But um, but you know, it's it's really about bringing everybody together because our LGBT kids, our LGBTQ community make up every single community, um, whether, you know, all the, all the areas of diversity, all geographic areas, all political persuasions, you name it. So, uh, you know, we, we are able to foster that, that dialogue that we don't see taking place pretty much across our country. Uh, which is very important. Now, let's talk about the children and uh, children who are struggling with perhaps telling their parents that um, they feel most comfortable in the LGBTQ community. What advice do you give to those children who maybe are afraid to talk to their parents? They're afraid of rejection. What can you offer those children? Sure, sure. You know, still today, I mean, as you, as you said, Jean, you know, there are kids who are afraid to come out, um, you know, and because they fear that they're gonna be rejected or sometimes you know, violence, uh, physical violence uh, as well. 
And so when we work with our kids, you know, every situation is different and we got to treat it as such. You know, there, there aren't two home environments that are exactly the same. There aren't two school environments or community environments that are the same. So we work with everyone to, you know, to get a real understanding of uh, where they're at um, and offer them support. And one of the key things through our organization is that our kids find support in one another as well. And they build up the strength and the resiliency um, to be able to come out to their parents. I mean, we also have a program that serves families and parents as well. And many times we will have parents that come to us before their kids come to us. And, um, you know, and they want to know how they could support their kids or they're coming because they have questions. And that's okay, you know, because when kids come out to their parents, you know, parents are coming out too. So, so we really work with the kids, coach with them, give them peer support. Um, you know, and what's really incredible is to see the resiliency and the leadership that they that they have. And many of them take that leadership and take it into their communities and schools as well. And we've just come out of the COVID-19 pandemic or we're coming out of the pandemic. And how did the pandemic affect your work? Did you move your programs online and and, and how, how could you serve your community during the pandemic? Yeah, you know, you know the pandemic uh, was difficult for everyone and, you know, um, in, in so many different ways. And for, you know, the not-for-profit sector, um, you know, really hit all of us hard because we weren't able to fundraise as well to support a lot of the programs that our grants don't support. But, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, we had to adjust really quickly to be able to serve our community. So we invested not only in technology like Zoom, but we uh, found some other technology as well that we were able to offer about uh, anywhere from 24 to 30 programs a week. Um, we actually served more people during the pandemic because it gave greater access. You know, one of the key things for the LGBT community um, is community, right? And a lot of times folks find that community through our programs or through our community centers. And so that was the key thing that we had to really figure out is to how, uh, you know, how to serve a community that is isolated to begin with, um, largely isolated to begin with, and then is even more isolated because we had a quarantine and stay in our homes. And for kids that may have been in homes that weren't safe as well. And, um, so we came up with a variety of programs, variety of services, a variety of means for, um, for kids to get involved. Our staff was amazing um, and they still are. Um, and uh, you know, as we return to in-person now, we're not getting rid of the virtual programming. We're gonna keep that as part of our future. I think you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the pandemic, not only in the delivery of our services, but also in self-care for our staff. You know, Cause you know, I, I mean, I know, uh, you know, I could just speak for our, our, our organization, our staff are so hardworking, they are so dedicated um, to the mission, um, you know, we deal with some heavy issues. And so it's important, you know, we learn to take care of one another as well. Yes, and now for our audience, we are with a David Kilnick, he is the co-founder, the CEO and president of LGBT Network. And uh, David, getting back to the children because we are a country where our youth is our future and so for an a child or a young person who um, is looking for help how can they find your organization sure sure thanks for asking that so for anyone looking for help um, for support um, or if you want to get involved as a leader or volunteer in any way in any capacity um, you can reach us uh, through our website at uh, www.lgbtnetwork.org. You can call us at 631-665-2300 um, or email us at info at lgbtnetwork.org. You know, whichever way you reach out, or through social media as well, on our Facebook page, Twitter, and YouTube. But um, no matter, uh, you know, what you need or where you are in your life, um, you know, we certainly will, will have something that could help support or help get you engaged a little bit more and active. And I think the virtual programming and the Zoom programming is particularly important for children, especially if um, they feel very isolated and they're not anywhere near uh, one of your centers, so to speak. And now getting back to you, David, and 
um, your um, ability to run this organization. I imagine it's a lot of work. I've heard that you've got, you receive government funding. Talk a little bit to our audience because many of our people watching want to get involved. Maybe they want to donate. Maybe they want to volunteer. Maybe they need your services. But what your budget is like and where your funding comes from. Sure, sure. So, you know, we, we've grown exponentially um, over the last uh, decade or so, really grew a lot. Um, and uh, our budget uh, post pandemic is uh, about five and a half million dollars now. And about 80% of that comes from a little bit more than 80% since the pandemic it comes from government funding. And that's a, a percentage we need to change. You know, we do need more uh, uh, more support uh, individually and, um, you know, and hopefully folks can help us to go to lgbtnetwork.org or certainly give a call. I'll, I speak, I could speak with anyone who calls. Um, it doesn't matter. Any size donation really helps. But, you know, for all the work that we do, and we do get grants, you know, those grants are um, very narrow in scope. Um, and the work is is wide that needs to be done, wide and far, you know, particularly for our young kids, because they're at so many, they live all over the place and they're at so many different points in their lives. And for our families too, we can't forget about the parents. We have to make sure that we're, we're helping the parents too. So that, that, that uh, individual support or that foundation support really helps us to do a lot of things that government funding does not help us to do. And I think, you know, there's a misnomer about government funding. I mean, government funding is, is, Great. I mean, we're allowed, to, you know, it, it allows us to certainly run some programs and services and to put people to work and employ people in doing this important work. Um, but government funding is, we, we have to uh, expense for that. And a lot of times government, government funding, particularly New York State, um, takes an awful long time to pay you. So, you know, for example, if we have a $150,000 grant, um, we could have fully spent that $150,000 and still waiting 18 months later to get that back. What kind of business could survive on that? And that's why the individual support is so important um, because while we're waiting to get that government money back, it still allows us to, um, to operate and have that cash flow. And I, and I think, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of nonprofits, um, you know, including ours, really had to be smart in the beginning to say, you know, not only thinking about how we're going to survive in March 2020, but to look down the road in December 2020 and make those decisions in March 2020, you know, knowing, um, you know, knowing the trajectory of, um, of, of how funding works. So the individual support is so key. It allows us to do the important advocacy that needs to be done that's not covered under government funding. Um, you know, it, there's so much work that needs to be done in, in, in getting people together and addressing some of the uh, homophobia and transphobia and biphobia that exists, um, you know, and, um, and to help to build community. And, and so, you know, we're so appreciative for everyone that, that supports us. Um, it really makes a huge difference. Yes, and I personally serve on about seven charity boards and a few of them do receive government funding, but the fundraising that the organization does and, and the private funding is key to the continuity of the work of those charities. And so for our viewers, any kind of donation given to a charity is vitally important now, David, what advice do you give to parents who might have a young child who is just discovering that they're part of the LGBTQ community and the parent may not quite know what to do? What advice do you give? Sure. I, I mean, you know, the most important thing is that, um, you know, is to make sure that they're there for support and, and love, right? Um, but also to, uh, you know, that it, it, it's okay to have questions, right? It's okay to have questions and we're here to help with that. Um, and we're here to help connect parents with other parents so that they feel part of a community and can have that peer support too. But the most important thing is to love your kid, um, you know, and, um, and, you know, if you, if you are able to offer that love and that support, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to thrive. They're not only going to survive, they're going to thrive. And I think that's really what every parent wants to see. Every parent wants to see their kid 
happy, right? And, um, and we know that love is not the problem in our world or in our country. And so if we're able to offer more of that um, and, and show more of that, um, you know, we'd have a much better world. And so, so with that, with the parents is that, you know, coming at, uh, when parents find out that their kid is LGBTQ, you know, that they're going to go through a coming out process too. And it's okay. They're going to start thinking, what if I tell someone else in my family? Or what if I tell my friends? Or what if I tell people at work? You know, and generally what they'll find, I would say a, a large majority of the time, is that they're going to hear from other parents, oh, my kid is gay too, you know, or I have a kid who's gay. And, um, you know, and, and, and so they're going to find that support too. But, you know, it's a coming out process for parents too. I think the key is for parents to give their children love, support, and then to show acceptance and, and to embrace all of our differences. To me, it really makes no difference uh, whether someone is A or B. We must embrace and love our children for who they are and what they are and accept them. And I love that you have programs both for children, uh, uh, for young adults, for middle-aged people and then for seniors and then I guess you have uh, programs for the parents is what I'm hearing and I think that's so important and now uh, David when uh, you look back on this journey that you've been through and I'm sure you've experienced um, um, just about everything uh, are there any particular incidents or situations that stand out in your mind and that you could relate to our audience and that perhaps we could all learn from? Um, you know, there's so much that has happened uh, over, over the years. Um, you know, and I think, you know, uh, even though I started this 28 years ago, and if I see one of those, you know, if I, if I run into or one of those young people come back now, I still call them kids and they're not kids. <laughs> you know, they're in their 40s, which is frightening <laughs> how long that I've been doing this. But, um, you know, but, but to see them come back, and still have that um, those friends that they made, um, you know that that extended family or their family that may be their family that they made back in the early to mid 1990s, and that they are doing what they wanted to do with their life. You know they are working in whatever profession they wanted to work in. That they are happy. That they are successful. That they they were able to get through life's journeys because they had that support. You know and that family that they built. Um, that to me is the most rewarding thing, you know, when I, when I see the smiles on the kids' faces or when they, you know, when they come back or when I get an email or a call from them, you know, on their excitement of pursuing their education or pursuing their careers or starting a family themselves, you know, becoming parents. And so, um, you know, just to watch that journey, you know, and knowing where they came from and the struggles that they may have had and how they were just so strong and resilient to, um, to get through that and overcome is really the most special thing and why I still love doing this work because it's, it makes a huge difference. It makes an impact in so many people's lives. It sounds as if you've created great community and if people come back to your organization after years and years, well, it sounds like you've, you're really doing something right. Now, what about volunteer opportunities? For example, I might be in a situation where I'm a teacher, but I'd like to help with uh, children after school. Are you, do you have tutoring opportunities available for volunteers? And, and, and what are the volunteer uh, opportunities? Sure, sure. You know, volunteers are so important, have been critical in our 28 year history, you know, particularly when I started in the beginning and I started as a volunteer for the first two years actually, um, and ran the organization as a volunteer. But, um, you know, so volunteers are key in so many different ways, whether it's helping out at our community centers, um, either operating the, the front desk, uh, if you will, and welcoming people um, to having folks there as we return to in-person programming for our Friday night youth programs. Um, to helping with different mailings, to helping with Long Island Pride, which we run. Uh, you know, there's so many different avenues that folks can help to getting involved on fundraising committees too. And so there's, there's uh, you know, whether it's services or whether it's the external community stuff that we do or the fundraising, um, there's really opportunities uh, at every different level for people to get involved. And I assume you vet your volunteers. 
Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think you know. There's um, one of the things in, in in working in this sector or industry for for 28 years is sometimes people say, "Oh, have volunteers." You know, it's free. There's no such thing as free, right? Because volunteers need to be trained. Um, you have to make sure that you provide the proper training to them, um, the policies, and, and you know, the operational procedures, um, supervision. Um, you know, and, and all along the way. So, um, you know, a volunteer, having volunteers is a program in and of itself. And part of that program needs to be um, having, you know, policies, training and, and supervision. Yes, Two minutes. And, and volunteers are vitally important to most charities. And of course, if you're thinking of volunteering, remember you are giving your time and your knowledge and you must go in and treat everyone with dignity and respect. And then in turn, you should be treated with dignity and respect. And for our viewers, if you want to donate, remember that any donation is of value. Never think that your donation of maybe 25, 50, 75 or $100 is meaningless because it's not. Those donations collectively really add up and you become part of a system of giving back and helping an organization such as the LGBT network. And again, David, could you give the website uh, for the donations and then if people want to volunteer or if they want to utilize your services, please give the information again. Sure, to either donate or volunteer, uh, you go to lgbtnetwork.org. Um, or call 631-665-2300 or email info at LGBT network. Um, you know, we, like you said, Jean, any amount is helpful, you know, and every single, uh, you know, a lot of people want to give back too. And so we have the opportunities for you to give back and get involved and get engaged as well. Which is all wonderful. And uh, David, as we end this interview, are there a few final words you want to leave our audience with? You know, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Um, thank you to you again you know, for not only having us, but for really, you know, bringing the important work of not-for-profits and charities to the forefront, um, you know, and that our organization is here for everyone. Uh, it's not just the LGBTQ community because it's everyone that makes up LGBTQ people's lives. And that's everyone here who's watching this show. And so, um, you know, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your family, whether it's your community or your school, you know, we're here for you um, and, and please reach out and uh, we will be there for you. David, I wanna thank you for the wonderful work you do. The work is very important. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Today's guest, David Kilnick, he's the CEO, the president and co-founder of LGBT Network. I'm Jean Shafroff, your host. I'll see you next week.